Amen. Uh, let's take the Word of God, if you will, please, and uh, find the uh, New Testament book of Philippians, please, Philippians chapter number 4. And I am looking forward to how the Lord has led, and uh, I've had conversations with many of you recently, and um, I've heard from you and some different things that maybe you've been experiencing, and I feel like the Lord has led me this way. What I'm going to do is um, put a little bit of a pause on um, my series that I've been going through, The Wise of the Christian Faith, and I'm going to uh, give a series of messages with God's help on the subject of prayer. And I look forward to it. I know the Lord has led me this way, and I have some different things I'd like to give to you. And I want to encourage you uh, with two things, all right? Two things before we get started today. And I know uh, perhaps some may be watching online, and we appreciate that so very much. But two things I'd like to encourage you with. Uh, first of all, I would encourage you as we go through this um, kind of just this, this series of a few messages. Uh, first of all, I would encourage you to listen with your heart. You know, it's easy sometimes to listen with our ears. And I remember when I was in uh, Bible college, I, I heard a lot of things. I listened with my ears. But, you know, the truth of the matter is it didn't all enter my heart. Um, I heard it, but it doesn't mean it made that, that impact that it ought to have made. And I want to encourage you, number one, to, to listen with your heart because the Lord is going to specifically and directly speak to us about certain things. And there's nothing more important that we could be helped with in our Christian life than our prayer life. The second thing I would encourage you to do is throughout this, this uh, short series is to uh, take very good notes about these things and write the points down. I, I try to do my best to give them to you in a way that you can write them down and uh, be able to remember them. I, I, I don't know about you, but it helps me when I can remember something that's been said. I may hear a message, um, and in my mind I can replay what the points were and what the main themes were of that message, and it helps me uh, to remember, recall, and then apply it to my life. So I encourage you to write the things down as things are said and as we learn things from God's Word. I think it can really help you. I want to help you. I really do. The Lord knows my heart. I want to help you. Um, God has helped me and is continuing to help me. And uh, I want to be a help to you. Philippians chapter number 4. We'll read just a few very familiar verses. And we'll use this as a springboard to, to get started on this theme. Uh, and then we'll return to this um, as we continue on with our theme and build on it um, with some different major themes on the subject. Philippians chapter number 4, notice with me in verse 6 and 7, beloved verses that we love very much uh, that can help uh, get us started on this theme. Paul the Apostle writes to the Philippian believers, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Would you begin in prayer with me? Father, we ask now that you lead in God in this message. Help our hearts, encourage us, and lead us and guide us that we may become better Christians, uh, those who would be improved in our prayer life. And we'll thank you for it. I pray now that you would just take distractions from our minds, forgive us and cleanse us of any sin, and prepare us to receive all that you have for us. Thank you again for your love and mercy and salvation in our lives. Bless now and we'll thank you for it because you're worthy of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This particular passage, as I want to begin with tonight, um, gives some specific commands that we as believers should be following um, that I would say are not necessarily easy commands, but commands that if God has given them to us, then we have to believe uh, that He has given us the equipment to be able to carry those out. He says to be careful for nothing. And when we think about the word careful, it doesn't mean in some way uh, being metic meticulous or uh, concerned with doing things right. That's not what it means. But being careful here means uh, anxious, being anxious. And he actually tells us not to be anxious about anything. The, this, the word that means the same thing as nothing is not anything. <laughs> and so he means not to be anxious about anything, but instead to take those things that we could be anxious about and respond to them differently. And let me say something about that, that I believe in our Christian lives, that many times the problems that we encounter 
in our lives as Christians are simply because we don't respond correctly to things that come into our lives because we will have things come into our lives. Uh, it's inevitable. It's impossible, but that those things will happen. Things will come into our lives. Even this week, things have come into my life, things have come into your life, things either unexpected or things you didn't know exactly uh, how to deal with those things. So many times the key to it all is not the actual things that take place, but how do we respond to the things that take place? How do we deal with them not only in the way our actions and so on, but in our own thinking, the way that we uh, deal with things in our own mind? And he says, do not respond with anxiety. That's the easy response, isn't it? Isn't it? That's the easy response. When something happens, you just go into kind of a state of anxiety or turmoil because of that thing that has happened. But he says instead, um, the response should be that of prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. And these are different levels. We have prayer. Supplication is a level deeper than that. And then thanksgiving should always be included in our prayers. He said this, all of these things together, prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving should be used to make our requests known unto God. What I would find encouraging with this is the fact that God wants to know, doesn't he? God wants to know the requests that we have. And in fact, he says, make them known. Um, this is a command to make known our requests to God. Uh, do you have a request? If you have a request, make it known. Uh, share it with the Lord and ask Him to meet that need. And He says, when these things take place, these prerequisites of prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, rather than anxiety, but the prayer and the supplication and thanksgiving, when these things are implemented in our lives, then we can have, what's the next verse say? The peace of God. The peace of God. Um, how many of you say, I want to have peace in my life? You're right. Uh, all of us would desire to live that way. We desire to live in, in the peace of God. Now, there's a difference between the peace of God and peace with God. As a believer in Christ, since we know Christ is our Savior, we have been made at peace with God. That's a position that we have. I'm no longer an enemy of God. I'm not at war with God. He's not at war with me but I've been reconciled to Him. That means to be at peace with God. But then there's a peace of God, and that's something that we desire and strive for, but could be absent in our lives. We could be a Christian, but live very uh, anxious or anxiety-ridden lives uh, and not be at peace. Um, but the Lord desires that we would be at peace. And He says, when these things are implemented, the prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, there is a promise here that's given. Don't you love the promises of Scripture? The promise here that is given is that if we do these things, the peace of God, which passes understanding, will keep our hearts and minds. There's so much in that verse in itself. But the peace of God, he promises, will fill your heart and soul and mind. And he says, this is a peace that passes understanding. In other words, when God gives you peace, it's really hard to explain it. It's really hard to explain to someone else, this is exactly how I feel. It's more of a state of being rather than it is a state of feeling. It's just we know that we're at peace with God. We have the peace of God in our lives because we've taken it to the Lord and left it in, hand, in His hands. And when we leave it in God's hands, He does a much better job than we do, doesn't He? He does a much better job. And so when we leave it in His hands, then we can have the peace of God which passes understanding. It's beyond our... our uh, Knowledge is beyond our ability to grasp things with our own minds um, and many times cannot explain it. It's a peace of God that passes understanding. And it says, we'll keep your hearts and minds. So these are two different uh, elements of our being, is our heart and our mind. Um, you know, those are not the same thing. Your heart is not the same thing as your mind. Your heart is the nucleus of all of your feeling and emotion and will and desire, it emanates from the heart. But the mind is simply what thinks, all right? The mind is where thoughts come, um, which can be troubling sometimes. Uh, our mind sometimes, when not directed by God and with not in the peace of God, can be a, um, actually a very crazy thing. 
It can be something that can really cause uh, anxiety, uh, can cause uh, dysphoria, and uh, things like that. And so when it's not ruled by the peace of God, it can really um, be, be something that's disillusioning to us. That's what the mind can be. But when it's under the peace of God, um, then that peace rules our mind and we're at peace with God. And so the peace of God that he promises, if we bring everything to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, the peace will not only keep our hearts, but also our minds. Our heart is the most internal self that, that we have, um, all the ways that we feel and in, in, in our internal being. But then the mind is the way in which we think. I think many times as Christians, I think our worst trouble is probably more with our mind than it is with our heart. Because most of us, we, if we truly love the Lord, our heart is, most of the time, we, we try to keep it in the right place. We try to keep it right with God. Um, hopefully we work hard at that, try to keep our heart right with God. But sometimes the mind can, can really get away from us. Um, but he tells us here that the mind also can be kept by the peace of God. Not just the heart, but also the mind can be kept. And he promises that, that if we will bring everything to him, everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, then the peace of God can come. And so what I would like to do um, with that kind of as our a preface, if you will, to what I would like to say in the series, I want to give, uh, Lord willing, four major, four major components or aspects of prayer that I would like to, to deal with and dwell on the next uh, few weeks. And so I would take them one at a time. And so this evening, I would like to talk to you about the priority of prayer, the priority of prayer. And this will be more of a teaching um, session and time um, and um, I, I will, um, I've thought about this a little bit, but I think that I'll make it informal. If, if someone has a question, if you, if you need to raise your hand or something, if something is not understood, I'm, I'm willing to help in that way. And so as we did the last several weeks, we kind of let you do that. And so if you do have something, you say, here's something I need understanding about before we move on, um, then that's all right with me. But I want to talk to you about the priority of prayer. And this perhaps is where we do lack in our Christian lives, is that we don't place the proper priority on prayer. Uh, we know prayer is important, but we're doing everything else except praying. We're not really making that a priority. Someone has wisely said, I would encourage you to write it down, that your prayer life is your Christian life. Your prayer life is your Christian life. So that means that if someone knew what your prayer life was like, they could immediately ascertain what your, your actual Christian life is like. If they knew how much you prayed and how important prayer was to you, then they could immediately have some understanding of what type of a Christian life you actually have. Now that's kind of an indictment, I think, for some of us if we think about it. Uh, because the truth of the matter is for many Christians, I'm not saying in this room, I just mean in general, um, that there are many Christians who, if that's the case, really have no Christian life whatsoever because they're not praying at all. And so the truth of the matter is, I believe this to be true. I'm not just reiterating something I've heard, but I believe it because it's true in my life. When my prayer life is lacking, my Christian life is proportionately lacking. If I'm not praying as I ought to be, I'm really not living the Christian life like I ought to be. And so if you want to have a good gauge or barometer, if you will, that kind of shows what your Christian life really is, it's going to be in direct correspondence with how you're praying and your prayer life. Now, maybe before moving on from that, perhaps we should define what we mean by your prayer life. And your prayer life has more involved in it than just simply praying from time to time. But prayer life is a way you live with the Lord, living in, in His presence and walking in His presence. Your prayer life is a continual thing. It's a habit. Uh, your prayer life is not something that just kind of comes and goes, but it should be an integral part of your life. And so you may not have a prayer life at all, um, but we ought to. We ought to have a prayer life, and that would be equal with or proportionate with our, our Christian life. 
And so I don't think that many of us perhaps understand the priority that prayer ought to have in our lives. There are many things that should point us to the fact that prayer is important, and I'll give you a few that we could think about. What are some things that maybe should point us to prayer? Well, I would say our inability, right? Our inability could point us to realize that we really need prayer because I'm not able to do what I need to do, and I'm personally not able to do anything God has called me to do and, and commanded me and directed me to do uh, without prayer and the strength that comes from that. So our inability would be one. A second thing would be our weakness, right? Um, how many of you are weak? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, of course. We're, we're very weak, and our weakness should not cause us to be just depressed or, or maybe in some kind of a state of gloom. But our weakness should drive us to our knees and to realize that I need prayer. Um, maybe a third thing would be our ignorance, right? Uh, this would lead us to prayer because many times we, we realize, I don't know, right? I just don't know. That's what ignorance is. Ignorance maybe has more of a negative connotation. We think about somebody being ignorant and we think they're foolish or something. But really the word ignorant just simply means that we don't know something. And so we many times have ignorance because we just don't know the answer. We don't know what to do. We don't know what's right in this situation or not. We don't know which direction to take. And so there's some ignorance there. Uh, also, I would say our frailty, right? Our frailty, how frail we are. Um, the Bible says that it speaks about that he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. And that is our frailty. We're very frail people. But then also I would say our tendency that we have to fall. That's our tendency, right? Really our tendency as when you see a, a baby walking around and trying to go from place to place and keeping his balance. Uh, he has a tendency to fall, doesn't he? He has a tendency to fall because he's really um, doesn't, if he doesn't have his mama or something to hold on to or some, something to grab on to, then he's, he's liable to fall because he has nothing to lean on. And so, so are we in our Christian life. Really, when we just try to kind of make it on our own and kind of walk around, we find that we're very prone to fall, very prone to fall. And, and just little things, little things can come into our lives and cause us to fall. Just like a baby could be running by, and, and if you touch him, he, he comes tumbling down. I've accidentally done that before to a baby. He's walking around, hey, how you doing? And just that little hand just kind of makes him fall over because they're very prone to that. Just a little thing could kind of knock them over. And so I'm saying in our Christian lives, it's the same way. Just a little thing can knock us over. And so we must realize our tendency to fall should drive us to prayer. Without the Lord, the truth of the matter is we will most certainly fall. Jesus says in John chapter 15, without me you can do nothing. And so certainly we will fall without the Lord. So let me give you a few things about how should prayer be a priority? How can we make prayer a priority? Let's give some specifics here that I think could help us. Uh, would you write this down? Number one, we should choose prayer first. We should choose prayer first. And for this, if you will turn to the Old Testament, um, and we'll just, for the remainder of our time this evening, we'll look at a few verses uh, mainly in, uh, in the book of Psalms. So if you'll turn to Psalm uh, 71, Psalm 71, and uh, our point here that we're discussing is that we should choose prayer first. What do we mean by that? When something happens in our lives that's adverse, or something happens that we don't understand or maybe don't like, then our first response to that should be prayer. That should be what we choose. And I'm choosing, using the word to, again, I'm choosing the word choose because I think it describes that we have to make a choice, right? A choice to pray. That we may not naturally do that. Uh, we may do everything else imaginable. If you break down the side of the road um, in your car, you'll do a lot of things to check the car out, to, to call people and do different things. Um, and that's just an example of something happening. You'll, you'll immediately have several things that you're going to do in that situation. But really, in general, in our lives, when things take place, no matter how big or no matter how small they may appear to be, we ought to choose prayer first. 
Notice Psalm 71, verses 1 through 3. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. And by the way, if you do trust in the Lord, you won't be confused. And then number, uh, verse number 2, deliver me, into thy, or deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Notice he says, Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. I understand this to say that when anything arises, when anything arises in our lives, it comes our way, we should continually resort to prayer. In other words, we many times use it as a last resort, but it really ought to be the first thing. It ought to be the first thing. Why? Because usually you go and find help by the person who can really help you first, and then if they can't help you, you go to other places. But the truth of the matter is, we need to understand that God is the one who can help us, right? More than anybody else or anything else. We should go to the one who can solve any problem, any problem in the world. And so we should choose prayer first. This should be what we continually resort to. When things don't go as maybe we planned or as we expected, we should be choosing prayer first. So I want to encourage you with that. First of all, if you're going to make prayer a priority, choose prayer first. And then number two, we should spend time in prayer. We should choose prayer first. Number two, we should spend time in prayer. Turn over a few pages to Psalm 55, please. Uh, Psalm 55, again, we have David here speaking. In uh, Psalm 55, in verse 16, Psalm 55, verse 16, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. I believe that this speaks of the frequency of prayer, that it should be something we're continually coming to, and I would say spending time there, uh, spending time in prayer. You know, the Lord Jesus, the gospel writers uh, record for us that he would rise a great while before day and to go out and spend time with his father in prayer. And so I think about that. And I realize that that's what our Lord Jesus did, who never had a sin problem, who never had the problems we have. He experienced all the temptations in this life. I'm thankful for that. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So if he would go to prayer and, and needed that nourishment and that help each day, then certainly we do. Certainly we do. And so time spent in prayer is never time wasted. Maybe write that down. Time spent in prayer is never time wasted. But it is time used wisely. Sometimes we think, oh, I've got so much to do, I don't have time to pray. Baloney. You have so much to do, that means you need more time to pray. To pray. If, you, if you have a lot of things to do, then you need God's strength to help you through. And you say, well, I just don't have enough time in the day. Well, that's when we have to sacrifice. We have to get up early or something. We have to choose a way in which we'll do that. Each person has to make their decision on that. Uh, some people uh, operate them better in different times of the day. But he says evening, morning, at noon. So there should be some continual connection with God throughout the day. There shouldn't be just one connection in the morning and that's it, or one in the evening, that's it. But it should be a repeated connection with God throughout the day. And we ought to spend time in prayer. When we spend time there in prayer, we will never be wasting it. We will never be wasting it. But instead, we'll actually find that that time in prayer was used wisely. The song so aptly says, Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him, him always and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children. Help those are, who are weak. Forgetting in nothing His blessing to seek. And take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus like Him thou shalt be. Thy friends and thy conduct 
his likeness shall see. The song Sweet Hour of Prayer has uh, much truth in it. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the temper, tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engages the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word, and trust his grace, I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. It is a sweet hour when we spend it with the Lord. It's never a wasted hour, but it's an hour that encourages and invigorates and strengthens us for the day ahead. And so we ought to spend time with the Lord in prayer. Number three, how are we going to make prayer a priority? We should seek God in prayer. We should seek God in prayer. In other words, this is not simply just some kind of a uh, simple list or something we're just presenting to God, but we're seeking Him. You know, many times in prayer we seek the wrong thing because we're seeking our needs, but we ought to be seeking the Lord. We ought not just to be seeking answers, but we ought to be seeking the Lord. When we go in prayer with the Lord, we should not be there just to get answers, but we ought to be there to get the Lord, to, to know Him, um, to seek Him. Psalm 55, uh, which I think is where we actually are already there. Psalm 55, verse 6. Um, I, think that's, I think I have the wrong um, particular psalm there. But it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And the Bible teaches in, in, in Jeremiah 29, it says we seek him, we'll find him. If we search for him with all of our heart, that's, that's in Jeremiah chapter 29. We seek him and find him if we search for him with all of our heart. You know, the Lord can be found. The Lord can always be found. He's never far from any of us. Call ye upon him while he is near. Write this reference down, James 4, verse 8. James 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. It's a blessed promise that if we draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to us. So in many sense, it's not his fault that we're not where we ought to be, but he's waiting on us to draw near to him. He will not force himself on us, but waits patiently that we will draw nigh to him. And he's ready and he's available to draw nigh to us. And so uh, Psalm 27, if you'll turn back there just a little bit, to Psalm 27. And notice this is mentioned here in Psalm 27 in verse number 7. Psalm 27, one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 27, verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. That's a good prayer. Have mercy upon me. We are constantly falling to His mercies. Brother James, do you have a question? Okay, I had 55, 6, but I had the wrong book. All right, thank you. So, so Isaiah 55, 6, so if you're uh, looking for that, um, that I'd mentioned earlier. Isaiah 55, 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. And then James 4, 8, and then Psalm 27, verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. So in prayer, we're not just seeking something, but someone. We're not just seeking something, but we're seeking someone. We're trying to know the Lord, and that is what prayer is. We're seeking God. And so we, we ought not get the wrong priority of just seeking answers and seeking certain things and, and whatnot, but seeking God Himself. This is how we're going to make prayer a priority, because we realize, I need the Lord, don't we? I need the Lord. Every moment of every day, I need Him. So I'm going to go to Him and seek Him. Not just seek this whole list of things that I want or that I need, but to seek the Lord Himself. Because I know that if I have the Lord on my side, if I have the Lord with me, then He'll help me through all those other things. 
and all those other needs that I experience in my life. We should seek the Lord in prayer. Number four, how will we make prayer a priority? We should pray before doing things would be number four. We should pray before doing things. In other words, we should pray before we act. We should pray before we act. Not after it and say, God bless what I just did, but pray before we act, before we do things. Here's a very interesting story. Uh, turn with me, if you will, please, to, uh, to, to the book of Joshua, if you will. Uh, I just want you to see here um, this very interesting story. We won't read the whole thing. I'll, I'll, I'll recap a little bit of it, and then I just want you to see a, a portion here. But in Joshua chapter 9, verse 16, we have here the story of the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites who heard that Joshua and the children of Israel had defeated Jericho, had defeated Ai, and now they're scared, right? They say, we're next, we're next. And so they, they come up with this whole elaborate scheme. And they say, we're going to go to Joshua, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to say, we're from a far country. We're from a far country. And uh, look what we have. They had sacks in their hand, and they said, our bread is moldy, and, uh, and our shoes on our feet are all worn out. And so this is what they say. And they try to deceive the Israelites into thinking that they're from, from some uh, far country, and they say, Joshua, make peace with us. Make peace with us. So notice what happens uh, down here in verse number 5. It goes to explain, uh, let's begin in verse number 4. They did work willily and went uh, uh, and made as, as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up, and old shoes and cloud upon their feet and old garments upon them, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua under the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and all the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country. And they go on to explain where they are supposedly from. In verse 11, Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say to them, We are your servants, therefore now make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you, but now behold, it is dry and it is moldy. Now, notice verse 13, And these bottles of wine, now this is the Gibeonites speaking here to Joshua and the children of Israel, these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these are garments, and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men, speaking of the, the Israelites here, and the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the prince of the congregation swear unto them. Now notice what happens. These people come, and they come up with an elaborate story. And instead of going and praying about it, what they ought to do, they fell for the scheme and immediately took of the victuals and made a league with them without even praying about it. And if we were to read further, we would find that there were some pretty big problems that arose from the fact that they didn't ask counsel in the mouth of God because now they have to deal with a decision they made that was not right. And later on down the line, they find out they're in a very tough relationship with these people uh, that they couldn't break because they had made a promise and a vow and all this kind of stuff. And so that's what happens. That's the point. That's what happens. When we make a decision like that, and we don't pray about it, we don't ask God about it, especially a major decision, we don't ask God about it. Then what happens is we find that we made a wrong decision, and later on we're trying to reverse everything, right? We're trying to go back and take it back, and we're trying to change everything, but it's too late at that point. We've already made a commitment, and so we can't really change those things. And now our life is not the best it could be, and where God wants it to be because we've made a wrong decision. So those things can be avoided if we'll just pray and ask the Lord about it. And many times if we pray, the Lord by His Holy Spirit, as a Christian, will lead us and say, no, that's not, that's not right. And you may not know the full answer, but you say, okay, I don't feel right about this. I feel the Lord's not directing me this way. And so let me hold off on that uh, instead of jumping into it. And so 
We should pray before doing things. We should not just jump into it. We should pray first and ask counsel uh, at the mouth of God and ask Him what He wants us to do. So this is one way we're going to make prayer a priority. Is we're going to say that I'm not going to make any major decisions uh, of consequence without praying about it first. Um, you know, and sometimes people may say, well, what are we going to do about this? What, what are we going to do about this? Well, let me pray about it. Let me pray about it. I don't have an answer. Let me pray about it. And that's, for some of us, we don't like that because we want to give answers, right? We want people just to believe that we got it all under control and in order. We want to be able to give answers, and we, we can fall under that that kind of trap sometimes. But it's best many times to say, you know, I don't know, but let me, let me pray about it. Let me ask the Lord um, what He wants me to do. And so, this is how we make prayer a priority, all right? We make prayer a priority by just making a habit of not jumping into things, but to praying, be praying about them first. And when we do that, we'll find that prayer becomes a part of our life. Why? Because every day we're always making decisions, right? And everything we're doing, we're always making decisions. Um, and I'm not saying every little decision has to be prayed about, but we sometimes have to make bigger decisions too. And when we make prayer a prerequisite for those decisions that we make, then we find that prayer becomes a way of life and a part of our lives if we pray before doing things. And then let me give you a final thing I would say that would help us to make prayer a priority in our lives. And it would be that we should pray for others. We should pray for others. This is how we make prayer a priority in our lives. I want us to see two verses in closing. If you'll turn with me, please, um, to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. We should pray for others. And this is how we will make prayer a priority in our lives. Ephesians chapter 6, now this particular, um, this particular passage, especially 1 through 10, we know of it as the armor of God. And so we talk about the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the, you know, the breastplate of righteousness, and the feet shod with the gospel of peace, and all these kind of things. But we kind of stop short there at the end. Because Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18, praying always. Maybe we ought to underline that word. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for, what's the next word? All saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. He says the final aspect of our defense armor is prayer. And he says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. You know, I believe when we pray in the Spirit, that means that we're praying God's agenda, not our own. When we pray in the Spirit, it means we're submitted to what He wants. Instead of us going to Him and with the whole list, Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, amen. But going to prayer and saying, Lord, what do you want me to, to pray about? Letting the Lord at least lead us in the things that we desire and in the things that we pray about. But He says, praying in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, for all saints. And I believe that if we make it a habit to pray for other people, it will begin to form a prayer life because we're constantly doing that. Because there's always people to pray for. I mean, you just hold a whole, a whole list tonight. We have prayer lists. We have one another. We have our families. We have so many people that we could and should and ought to be praying for. And there's many benefits of that. It helps you to love those people more. It helps you to care about them. It reminds you. Sometimes I, I'm praying for someone, and then I think, oh, I should ask them about that. I forgot to pray. You know, I forgot to ask them how that went you know, or something. And, but I've remembered it because I've prayed for them. And uh, so praying for others has a lot of benefits. But the truth of the matter is that we should be praying for all saints, those in our lives that we know. Other believers is what that means. We ought to be praying for them. And the point is, when you make it a habit 
of praying for other people, it will begin to form your prayer life. And then you'll be constantly praying because there's always people to pray for. And so we ought to be praying for one another. And then uh, turn with me to uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2. We've read this very recently. 1 Timothy chapter 2. What are we told to pray for here? 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. I exhort therefore, 1 Timothy 2, 1, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, there's that word again, we didn't talk much about it, but supplicate is to intercede with earnestness. Intercede with earnestness. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, that means praying on behalf of others, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We ought to thank God for people, right? That are in our lives. We ought to thank God for people. For kings and for all that are in authority. That includes every person in national authority. Every person even in church authority. Every person that's in authority of any kind. He says, for kings and for all that are in authority. That we may lead. This is the purpose of prayer. That we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. This is the goal. If we pray for others, it helps us to lead a quiet and peaceable life, especially those in authority. It helps that they can um, institute the right values and uh, the right laws so that we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. It is good and it's acceptable in the sight of God our Savior to pray, to pray for those in authority and to pray for one another. God likes that. Now, we can put it this way. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the golden censer, that's the prayers of saints. And it talks about the way that incense <laughs> rises into the nostrils of God, that prayer is as incense to God. God, God really does savor the prayers of His people. And then what does it say? Verse 4, Who will have all men to be saved? The Lord would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So who have all men to be saved? What should we be praying for? We should be praying for lost souls. We ought to be praying for lost souls because you know why? You want to pray for something God wants you to pray about? Pray for a lost person because the Lord cares about the lost person. He's not willing that any should perish. He will have all men to be saved. You know, when you're praying for a lost person, the Lord likes that. Because He wants them to be saved too. And He wants us to be interceding on behalf of those who don't know the Lord. He wants them to be saved. We want them to be saved, don't we? We have a strong desire. I have people in my heart and mind I pray for and just, Lord, speak to them that they may come to know you. But even my desire is not as strong as God's. God has an even stronger desire for them to be saved. We ought to be praying for others, for saints, for our believers, and we ought to be praying for the lost because the Lord desires that, we, we would, that they would be saved. This will help us to have a priority, prayer, the right priority in our lives when we pray for others and pray for the lost. So how are we going to make prayer a priority? We're going to choose prayer first. We're going to spend time in prayer. Uh, we're going to seek God in prayer. We're going to pray before we act, and we will pray for others. And if you do these things, then I, I guarantee you, if you do these things, then you will begin to see that a prayer life is, is forming. And you're beginning to pray daily. Um, and it's really drawing you closer to the Lord. You're drawing nigh to Him. And this way, prayer can be the priority that God wants it to be. Well, thank you so much for uh, your attention tonight. And I hope that you've written these things down and been helped. Miss Nancy. Yes, but I, I'm trying to differentiate between just simply seeking for things. Um, for I could go to God in prayer and I could say, Lord, heal this need that I have, or would you provide this money? So we could be seeking these certain things, but that's different than just going to the, going to the Lord because you want to know God's mind. You kind of want to understand what He wants. Um, I'm not saying I fully understand that, but I do think that seeking the Lord is deeper than just seeking an answer or seeking things. And I think that that does come a lot of times from Bible reading because, you know, I, I found it to be helpful to pray the Bible. Um, I think that's one way to seek the Lord. 
that, that when we, we read a verse, you know, when, a lot of times we're reading the Bible, we're not thinking about praying. We're thinking about reading. But sometimes I read them, I stop, and I just pray that verse because all of a sudden there's a connection between that and my heart because I realize this is what I want. And so I'm, I'm seeking the Lord for that. Uh, does that help maybe a little bit? Yeah, I think, I think uh, seeking the Lord is kind of a, a, the next level. Uh, that's one way I could say it. Yeah. Right. No, that's good. I mean, and, and so when you spend time with God, you don't always have to be going through a list of things, but you could be praising Him. Um, you could be just kind of basking in His presence, uh, just enjoying Him, enjoying the Lord. Because he wants to be that companion to us. So maybe, so maybe seeking the Lord will go beyond even those things, but seeking his companionship, right? And uh, his understanding and his knowledge and really seeking God to show you uh, his truth. And, and a lot of times it does come through his word, but his knowledge. Brother Dakota? Yeah, I think it's very important in our prayer life that we are, yes, on, in kind of in tune or on the same page with what God wants um, in asking Him to kind of uh, show us, right, show us what He wants and what He wants us to pray for. Yeah. Right. Praying to get to know, you know, like the brother said, like praying, trying to figure out what he wants instead of what, you know, it may not be what we want. And then just kind of like getting on the same page with God and like understanding him more. Yeah, and I think that sometimes maybe the reason we don't pray is because we've asked for a list and he didn't give it to us. So then we don't pray because we don't realize that in prayer, and, and hopefully this helps answer these questions that we're not just seeking an answer, but prayer with prayer comes companionship, joy, peace. So we're seeking God for those things. We're seeking God for companionship and peace and joy so that if we get disappointed, God didn't answer some prayer, we just stop praying. Well, then you're going to miss out on everything else. You're going to miss out on the companionship, the joy, and the peace. So I just think we need to understand that prayer is deeper, and maybe that has much to do with the seeking aspect, that it's deeper than just answers to to our needs, but all the other blessings, and hopefully we can bring those out more as we study this, all of those blessings that come in with prayer. So, yes, yeah, we will come, we're going to come to that too uh, later on. Um, and so there's a lot more to prayer than just asking and receiving, but all those benefits that come along with it and, and understanding that will help us to have a better prayer life. Is there other, any other questions or, or uh, comments? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, communicating, uh, communion, maybe is a good word. Um, so it doesn't have to just be almost like we're presenting, like a presentation or something, like coming for God in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know. But I think talking to the Lord is a wonderful practice because you can do that anytime. You know, throughout the day, you can just talk to the Lord. And um, as, as I've mentioned before, you know, sometimes you can start a prayer and you don't even say amen hardly throughout the day because you're just continuing that throughout the, pray all, uh, the day all the way to the end. So it's just a string of prayers. It's just a one long prayer, and that's the talking to God. And that's a wonderful element when we can bring that into our lives of talking to the Lord. I think that really helps us. Good. Yeah, anybody else? Any other questions or comments? Well, good. I, um, I hope this is helpful to you, and, and um, I think it will be. And I appreciate the questions, input, and all that kind of thing. Um, and I truly believe if we put those things into practice, we will begin to see we're really having a prayer life and, and what a blessing that is. Let's close in prayer together.